Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You know, the scripture says the things that have been freely given to us by God. My question this morning to you, is the gospel free? Uh, the gospel, of course, we know the word gospel in the Greek actually means good news or a good message. And it's what the word gospel means. Most of us like free stuff. I mean, how many does You go to Sam's? How many Sam shoppers do we have here? You go to Sam's, and what do they do on every corner there? They got a free sample of something there. We like free samples. We like it to be tax-free, gluten-free, 100% uh, free. You know, we, we like all the free stuff. But is the gospel free? Is it really free? This morning, I want to talk to you about 15 different men. We know there were 12 men that Jesus called, personally called, to fulfill his mission here upon the earth. Now, Jesus came for two different purposes. One purpose was to die. He came to die. He came to give his life on Calvary's cross. That was the purpose for coming. The other purpose he came was to build a church. If you remember the story in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he said, who do men say that I am? And they gave him all kinds of answers. Some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say uh, uh, a good prophet, a teacher. But they answered on and on and on. And Jesus patiently listened as they answered the question. And when they ran out of answers, Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Now, we know Peter was one who, like many of us, oftentimes opened his mouth and inserted his foot. Amen. But this time, Peter gave an answer that was a divine revelation from God. He said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you remember, Jesus said, Peter... Flesh and blood did not reveal this to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And that's something that we need to understand in our lives. You know, we're called to witness the good news of Jesus Christ. But we need to understand that no matter how hard we try what we do, there's not a one of us here that can convince someone else that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We can't do it. Amen. Only God can do that. When God reveals himself to that person. He went on to say, he said, Peter, upon this rock, and a lot of people think he's talking about Peter. He wasn't talking about Peter. He was talking about the fact that he is the Christ. He said, upon this rock, I am going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus came to build a church. And that's what that was the one of the purposes of the calling of these 12 men was that they might build this church that Jesus had come to build up on the earth. The Bible describes the calling of these 12 men. Now, uh, no particular order here, not necessarily the order in which uh, Jesus called them. But he called a man here that we just talked about by the name of Simon. Jesus named him, called him Peter, uh, gave him a new name, uh, which is a rock. The word Peter actually means a small stone. He was not the rock in which Jesus was building the church on. He was a rock. He was known as Peter, Simon Peter, uh, uh, different things. Uh, he was... One of the original uh, uh, disciples that were called one of the first four, probably anyway. And, and then there was Andrew, his brother. Now, Andrew was a, an unusual man. 
He was a, a, a man of great stature, a man of integrity. We don't know anything about him. You say, well, how, how do you know he's a man of integrity, a man of honor? How would you like to go around all your life? This is Dane. He's Philip's brother. This is Andy. He's Steve's brother. Everywhere he went, there's Malcolm. He's Foley's brother. Everywhere Andy, Andrew went, he was known as, this is Andrew, Peter's brother. He didn't have his own identity. Nobody knew who he was. He was Peter's brother. But yet, Andrew never complained. He never grumbled about it. He, he, said, he never told, I'm, I'm myself. I'm my own person. He was content to be Peter's brother. And he, again, one of the twelve. Then there was James and John. James and John were fishermen. Uh, uh, there was Philip. Philip probably uh, had an evangel heart of an evangelist. If you remember the calling of Philip, the first thing when Jesus spoke to him and, and talked to him, first thing he did was he ran back down to, the, to the, another city and said, hey, you got to come with me. I, we found this man, Jesus. We found the Messiah, the one they've been, the, the prophets were talking about. He had a heart to go find somebody else. And that somebody else was Bartholomew, who was also known as Nathaniel. Uh, he was probably an architect. If you remember the story, the calling of, of Nathaniel, uh, he, he was the uh, one that, that uh, um, Philip went back, back down to, to find. And, and when he found him, um, he, he said, uh, well, you know, can, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But then when he came to Jesus, Jesus said, do you remember when Philip came down and told you about me? Before that, you were standing there, leaned up, propped up against a tree. And when he described what he was doing, when Jesus was able to see him in another city, in another town, and, and was able to, to recognize what he was doing, then he believed that, he, that this was who it was, that this was the Messiah. Then there was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector for the Roman government. The Bible said Jesus came by one day. Now, Matthew probably... Uh, a man uh, who was pretty much taken with money, probably may not have been rich, but was well-to-do, had plenty, because, and he made his living off of overtaxing people because what he did, the Roman government said, here's how much taxes you'll pay us. Anything you get above that, you keep for yourself. The Bible said that when Jesus came by, and said, come follow me. He said, he just got up away from the table, left everything behind and followed Jesus. Then there was a man named Thomas, or also called Didymus. He was probably a fisherman from the region in which he lived. The word Thomas and the word Didymus both, one's a Greek name, one's an Aramaic name. They, they both mean the twin. So most likely he had a twin brother or sister. But the Bible doesn't mention that. We, we often call Thomas the Doubting Thomas. Brother Andy brought out Wednesday night in the Bible study. They all doubted. We just call Thomas the Doubting Thomas. And then there was the one called James the Less. Or James the son of Altheus. Now possibly this could have been the brother of Jesus. Because that... Son of Alphaeus is not a person, but it is a place in which he was from. Uh, possibly the writer of the book of James. Then there was Simon the Zealot. The Zealot means he, he was part of a group of men who had a desire to overthrow the Roman government. And probably the reason that he followed Jesus 
is because he probably thought Jesus was going to set up an earthly kingdom here on the earth and was going to overthrow the Roman government and be in charge. Uh, his, his desire in life was to overthrow the government and take over. Probably a farmer. Uh, the next one that was called was Jude, also known as Thaddeus, also known as Judas. And again, uh, a possible brother of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another disciple that very little is known about. Uh, probably, most likely wrote the book of Jude. Uh, there is only one scripture in the Bible that he spoke. You find that in John 14, 22. And then the last one, Judas is a carrion. The Bible said Judas was a thief. He betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Um, he was the one that complained about the woman breaking the bottle of oil open and, and washing Jesus' feet with this expensive oil. He said, you know, we could have taken that money and given it to the sold that oil and given it to the poor. Most likely, commentaries say that he, he wasn't willing to, to take that oil and sell it and give money to the poor, but it was just more money than he could steal out of the purse of the disciples. I've heard people say, you know, I won't be surprised when I get to heaven if Judas is there. I will be surprised if he's there. The Bible says that he regretted what he did. He, he betrayed Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Guilt came upon him. He went back. He tried to return the money. They wouldn't take it. He cast it down on the floor at their feet. And he went out and he hung himself. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he said, Godly sorrow leadeth to repentance. Worldly sorrow produces death. He was sorry for what he did, but the Bible never mentions him ever repenting of his sins. It talks about him going out and killing himself. His sorrow led to his death. Not his forgiveness. He was driven by greed. Everything he did was for money. Though that was the original 12. The next one to speak about is a man named Matthias. If you remember in the book of Acts, the disciples are together. Judas has hung himself. And they feel led of God to pick someone to replace Judas. Now, if you read the scripture, it said, they were speaking and they said, we need to pick someone that has been with us from the very beginning. Now, we know that Jesus <coughs> had multiple disciples. He didn't just have 12. There was one time it said he anointed the 70 disciples and sent them out. Or the 70 came back in. There was many disciples that Jesus had, but there was just simply 12 that he picked, handpicked, to, to build this church that he came to build. So they picked this man named Matthias. They did it by casting lots. Now we think casting lots is kind of an odd way to do things, but that's the way things were done in biblical times. But they cast lots to divide the, the, the promised land up among the tribes. Uh, they, they found men guilty of crimes by casting lots. David divided up the priesthood by casting lots. Achan was found guilty by casting lots. It came from the fact that the high priest had a, a pocket or a pouch on his vest. And in that pocket he carried two stones, a white stone and a black stone. The Urim and the Thummim. And what he would do is when they had something to decide, uh, 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 do we move on or do we stay put? Or is he guilty or is he innocent? They would reach in that pocket and pull out a stone and they would make a determination. If it was a white stone, the man was declared innocent. If he pulled out the black stone, he was declared guilty. 
If he pulled out the white stone, they packed up the tents and they began to move. If he pulled out the black stone, they stayed in camp. So everything was done in the Old Testament by casting lots. This was not unusual. Then the next person is Saul of Tarsus. We know him more as the Apostle Paul. Paul had a, 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 this experience with Jesus on the Damascus Road. Uh, Paul was a, a, a cruel Saul, was a very cruel man. He, his uh, purpose in life was to destroy this church that Jesus came to build. He was out to kill the disciples and destroy every one of them as he could. If you remember the story of Stephen, and Stephen was being stoned to death, uh, they said that, that Saul held the coats of the men stoning him to death so they could stone Stephen to death. Stephen standing there before him said he saw the heavens split. He looked into the heavens and gazed above and he saw Jesus sitting at the right hand side of the Father and he said, into my, your hands I commend my spirit. And they stoned him to death and Saul went away happy because another Christian had been killed. That's who he was, but that's not who he became because he became a dedicated follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The 13 or 14 books, whether you think that he wrote the book of Hebrews or didn't, out of 27 books were written by Paul, this man who was the, the Apostle Paul, this evangelist. Now, we know that Easter is not about death. We're not celebrating the death of Jesus when we celebrate Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection. Amen. But I want to talk to you just a moment about death. Because every one of these men gave their life. Andrew was crucified in a Greek city on an X-shaped cross. Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, had the skin ripped from his body while he was still alive. Now, they most likely did that just like they did Jesus. They took him and they chained him to a block and they literally beat him with whips that had metal shards in the end of them so that when they hit it across their back and it pulled across their back, it literally ripped the skin from their back. So he's skinned alive and then he is beheaded in a place uh, modern day Turkey. Peter was crucified. But when he went to crucify Peter, he said, I'm, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the manner of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So they hung him upside down on the cross. And they crucified him that way. He, he was probably, they say, probably crucified in what today would be considered the Vatican City. Jude or Thaddeus was shot to death by Arras in what is today Beirut. Thomas was on his knees in prayer at an altar and had a lance run through his back. Matthew was slain with a sword, beheaded, probably in Ethiopia. James the Less was shot, was murdered by an angry crowd. Uh, he was uh, uh, shoved off of the pinnacle of the temple and he was beaten with a club and stoned to death. James, the brother of John, was killed with the sword, uh, beheaded, most likely. Uh, Philip, matter of fact, uh, James' death is the only death of the disciples that was recorded in the Bible. Philip was hung, and while he was being hanged, they threw stones at him. Simon the Zealot was, uh, there's different stories about his death, but he was martyred. Uh, some say he was crucified, some say he was beheaded, others say he was sawed in half. Matthias was beheaded. The Apostle Paul was martyred for the gospel's sake, most likely beheaded in Rome. But you know, it, each one of these men were killed, were put to death. They, they say that John was probably 
the only disciple that may have died a natural death. But if you remember the story of John, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And what they did on the Isle of Patmos was they dipped the person down in hot oil to literally burn their bodies all the way, their entire bodies, so they would be scarred for life just in case they ever escaped from the island, they would be identified. Other stories say they gouged out their eyes before they took them out and turned them loose on this island. But every one of these men gave their life for the gospel's sake. When Jesus gathered together, Brother Andy, I guess we ran out of time, or he focused more on the, the resurrection on Wednesday night. But we were in chap Mark chapter 16. And close to the end of the chapter, Jesus spoke to the disciples before he was ascended into heaven. And he said, go into the world and preach the gospel, the good news to every living creature. And if you notice these men, they, they died in Greece, in Turkey, in Rome, in India, in Ethiopia, in Jerusalem, in Palestine. All these men died all over. The, they didn't huddle themselves together in Jerusalem and say, well, we need to have church service this morning. So, you know, we'll get together in private. So, no, you know, they went out into the world as they were commanded to do. Because he said in Acts 1 and 8, he said, you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And these men gave their lives carrying out that mission that God had sent them to do. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel. Not only did these 13 men give their lives but we know that Jesus Christ gave His life as well. Jesus came to die. Salvation cost Jesus Christ His life. You and I cannot be saved except Jesus died on the cross. Except Jesus shed His blood. Paul wrote in the book of Philippians, and being found in the appearance of a man. Don't, don't mistake anything about Jesus' death. It was painful. It was painful for Jesus. Jesus, when He went to the cross, He went to the cross as a man. Found in the appearance as a man. He humbled Himself. And he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He gave his life. Jesus' purpose in life, he came. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, he talks about being the good shepherd and giving his life. And he said, I lay down my life for the sheep. He said, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it back up again. You know the story Brother Andy shared with us Wednesday night. Jesus died on the cross. They came by, they broke the bones of the two thieves, their legs, so they couldn't support themselves, so they would have to die sooner. But when they came by Jesus, he was already dead. They thrust the spear into his side and said, blood and water spill out. They took him down off the cross. They took him to a borrowed tomb. They were somewhat prepared the body. They rolled the stone in front of the tomb so that there was no way that they could get the stone rolled away and steal the body and say he came back to life. But when the ladies got there to properly prepare the body for burial and death, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. That's what we celebrate today. Yeah. The resurrection. The Bible says that He arose 
from the grave. He is alive today. The Bible says He is sitting down at the right hand side of the Father interceding for you and I. That's where He is at today. And that's what we celebrate today. Again, I ask you, is this, is this salvation that we enjoy? Is this salvation that we have been partaker, allowed to be partakers of? Is it a free? Is it a free gift? It was given freely. There's no question about that. We can't earn it. We can't work for it. We can't buy it. But was it free? My opinion, it was not free. It was freely given. But it cost men their lives. It cost Jesus Christ His life on the cross of Calvary. It, it cost 12, 13, 13 men their lives. Getting that word out. Getting the message. Getting that good news. That gospel out to the people. It's good news. They went out to share it with others. <laughs> Ephesians says, Christ also suffered once for sin. The righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the Spirit. Jesus had to be put to death. It cost Him His life so that you and I could have life. And as I said, the Bible says, now He is set down at the right hand side of God the Father. Interceding for you and I. Jesus Christ is very much alive today. Each one of us can be alive as well. Only in Him and through Him. Paul said in Galatians 2 and 20. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. Paul knew that once he came to Christ, that he was no longer alive, but Christ was living through him and in him. Have we realized that? Have we realized that we must be willing to give our life in exchange for the gospel, the good news? In Revelations 3 and 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. And to him that overcometh will I grant the right to sit in my Father's kingdom as he has granted that right unto me. Twelve men were originally called. Now, Judas may have been called for a purpose. Jesus knew in the beginning that G Judas would not give his heart and life to him. He knew that he would betray. Judas just couldn't overcome the things of the world, the greed that had him, that held him bound. We need to look at our lives. What is it that holds us bound today that we refuse to let go that we might be overcomers? And overcome the things of the world. The Bible said when he called Peter and Andrew. It said they left their nets. And followed him. Matthew followed him. He walked away from the table. Every one of the disciples. They left their life behind. And followed Jesus. Are we willing to. To leave our lives behind and follow Jesus. That's what is required of each one of us. We must be willing to die to self and to sin to live again. Jesus is very much alive today. Sitting at the right hand side of the Father. Interceding for you and I. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't keep him. Are you living for him today? Let's pray.
Father, we do thank You this morning for the privilege and honor to come and to share Your Word. And Father, we realize that there have been many lives that have been given so that this Gospel could still be proclaimed today. And Father, we realize that if Jesus Christ had not given His life on Calvary's cross, there would be no Gospel to share. But it's not just the fact that He lived and that He died. But the good news is that He arose from the dead. And we celebrate that this morning, Father. We celebrate the resurrection which offers to us salvation. We're thankful for Your love, Your mercy, Your grace, for all Your many blessings. We thank You for the gift of life that You have freely given us and Father, we pray that we'll each be willing to die out to self and to sin and to live a life that's pleasing to You. Father, we pray this morning that You speak to each heart. We pray that You minister to every need that's here today. And most of all, Father, if there's one present this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior of their life, Father, we pray that this will be the day of their salvation. Help us each to hear your voice, to draw closer to you, to yield ourselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Father, you might be glorified here today. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to stand with me as we close. We'll close with a hymn this morning. Uh, as always, we ask you to uh, be obedient to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, uh, to prepare your hearts to take communion this morning.